Okay then, let's see if we can work this one out. So, in, in a pragmatic randomized, which would be a large scale clinically effectiveness pragmatic trial, they're the sort of trials that the HTA Clinical Trials and Evaluation Board and the Commissioning Board like to fund. They're the trials that are used, the design is used to change clinical practice, so you know that. So what type of outcomes, and I've sat on the board for the last five years, we had long discussions about outcomes and we make sure that they're the relevant ones to pragmatic trials. What type of prime, particularly primary outcome would be relevant in a pragmatic large scale clinical effectiveness yeah. trial? Death, definitely, yes. <laughs> Death would absolutely be a relevant one. Why is the question? It's important to patients, yeah, who said that? So death is definitely important to patients, but my question to you would be, so you might say death after an operation, but within what time frame? Well, what do you, that, that would probably, that's important. Yes. Exactly, so, exactly. I know, but I'm sitting on the funding board, and I'm and you're a patient, and you die on day 31. It's kind of important, yeah. not just if you die within 30 days. So death after surgery is absolutely important, but the time frame would always be not in the hospital death or not death in 30 days. It would always be six months or a year. It's got to be a patient-centered outcome. Any any other suggestions of a of a patient-centered outcome in a surgical trial? Quality of life definitely would be, but you'd need to be more specific and say what aspect of quality of life. And again, at what time point? Not a week later, but some months later. Reoperation, re that's a really interesting one. What do other people think about reoperation? That would occur very soon after surgery, on the whole, unless you had reoperation down the line for a uh, breast reconstruction problem. But reoperation for surgical complications, that a patient centered outcome. Hands up. Hands up, yes, you think it's a patient centered outcome. Reoperation in your first hospital stay. Hands up. You've got four. Hands up that think it isn't a patient centered outcome. Not never sure. <laughs> Thank you. It's probably not a patient centered outcome in that you wouldn't use it as a primary endpoint in a pragmatic trial. You totally want to measure reoperation rates as adverse events, and you'd definitely look at them, but you wouldn't use it as a primary outcome. That, would you agree? It may just depend on the research question. Okay, what's an explanatory trial in surgery? An explanatory trial or a, a trial, an efficacy trial is looking at how something works rather than the first one, which is looking at whether it works. So the, the mechanisms around how something works. So they tend to be much smaller studies, single centre, often a new technique that's been very carefully evaluated in a tight setting very tightly controlled setting to, to really look at the mechanisms around how it works. What type of outcomes would you want to measure in that setting? So let's give an example. Oh, go on. Yes. Something that's objectively measurable is specific to the procedure. Yes. The team, and it's it's better than what you the ideal setting. Yes. So it would always have to be fit all the other things we've said. So it'd be objectively measurable, and it would be um, something that. Would be related to treatment effect, but be a very early outcome. So say you've got a new technique, say you're using some minimal access surgical technique rather than a standard operation. A typical type of outcome in that situation might be something like blood loss. You just measure it, you can measure it on the day of surgery, and it's a physiological endpoint if you like. May or may not be relevant to patients in the long term, <coughs> but it's definitely relevant immediately to the surgical intervention. So they, and they don't show that something works, they begin to show how it works. Minimal access surgery may have better patient outcomes because there's less blood loss. <coughs> you don't know for certain, but that would begin to give you evidence that it's safe and that it then should be evaluated. You get that first, an explanatory trial first, and then you do your large scale pragmatic trial. These are complicated issues. Right, uh, I'm going to give you the answer. I was going to give an example of Ducatron surgery here. So what would be a patient-centered outcome for an operation? I'm sorry, I spelled that wrong. Operation for Ducatron's disease. What? Return to work. Yes, that would be a patient-centered outcome. It may, it's a difficult one because not everyone works. What would be an explanatory type of outcome for an operation for Ducatron's disease? What would be a more physiological outcome? 
angle, angle, that's it. So we've been involved in a trial that's been funded for, um, what's it called, Needle Fasciotomy versus Needle Fasciotomy versus the Standard Open Operation. We have spent months, years, five years probably, working this out, the primary outcome, and all the, funny enough, all the hand surgeons wanted to measure what angle your finger was at, but we've ended up with settling of a score of patient function and also pain, because that was the only one there was, although the final lesson was painful. <laughs> but it's about the impact on the patient in a pragmatic trial. Okay, we've got the last, these are important, is, should we do final minutes or should we stop? Are you sure? We're going to stop by, finish by 10 past, so you've got a few minutes to answer these questions about <coughs> blind surgeons in trial. This is um, my colleagues and I, and we, for a few seconds, just for a few, we were doing the laparoscopic esophagectomy, and for a few seconds we had some blindfolds put on us, and I tell you, for about 30 seconds while they took the food from, it was terrifying. <laughs> so it's definitely difficult to blind surgeons in surgical trials. Right, what is blinding? <laughs> What's blinding in a trial? Go on, it's all to do with outcome assessment. And it, there's no strict rules about it. So what you describe, if you're blinding anybody in a trial, what you do is you just specifically say who was blinded. So we have a randomised trial of liver bed surgery with blinded outcome assessors, or with blinded patients, or with not blinded surgeons. But you actually just describe who is blinded. Now the number of different groups of people that are blinded will tell you whether it's double or triple or quadruple blinded, but that doesn't matter anymore. Just always describe who's actually blinded. That's the key. So in a double-blinded trial, two members of the team would be blinded, but the key is to describe which groups of people they are. Much more difficult. What is ascertainment? Oh, this is the answer to the question. Is it what was it? <laughs> Sorry, the question was what type of blinding... I've told you the answer. The question was what type of bias does blinding outcome assessors protect against? And the answer is ascertainment bias or, or detection bias. Because if you blind the outcome assessors and they don't know what the patient was allocated to, they won't be more likely or less likely to, to assess the outcome in a way that might be affected by knowing that information. So detection bias or ascertainment bias can be prevented. And it's well proven that if you don't blind people, you get this bias creeping in. So it's really important if possible to blind outcome assessors. So the difficult question is what does blinding, how does blinding differ from allocation concealment? We talked about it a bit earlier on. How does blinding differ from allocation concealment? Blinding of outcome assessors, that would be the question really. Oh, I, 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 no, I, I don't think there's a lot of difference between them. <laughs> 
I tend to think that the, the allocation of concealment is a form of blinding, as I said before. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So the randomization <laughs> sequence is hidden from the recruiter is, is the allocation concealment, and the blinding is when your outcome is sensitive. Maybe, okay, Jelena really gets us on that. Um, I'm not going to ask you these questions at 10 past, I'll tell you the answer. So, when we come to outcome reporting, that was the third one, we talked about selection and measurement, we talked about reporting. The key thing about reporting outcomes in trials is to report what you said you'd measure, and to report the primary outcome, and to report the secondary outcomes that you said would be measured. So, there's this thing called outcome reporting bias, where what people do is they look at the results of their trials, so they just look at all the results, and then they cherry pick which of those results they're going to actually report on the basis of the results, rather than on the basis of what they agreed to measure in the first place. And funnily enough, people, what they do is the results in amongst the tertiary exploratory outcomes, number 150, there'll be a statistically significant result down there somewhere that, that did occur by chance. And the people that report the results of the trial will cherry pick that one and report that one in the literature, and then you get this over-optimistic treatment effect published. And if you look at systematic reviews of trials that have all cherry-picked their statistically significant results, you then get this over-optimistic treatment effect reported from systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which is dangerous because it means that people are then using treatments thinking that they work when they may not work. So outcome reporting bias is not a good thing, and to be avoided, and the way you would avoid it would be by using the core outcome set of trials, which would mandate what you report, and you would always report the same things. Now, I'm going to leave three questions up. You can have lunch, but for those of you who want to think about these three questions... Oh, I've got the answer from there. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. There's three questions with us. <laughs> you can think about it, and we'll stop the lunch now.